Okay, we're starting now lecture three. Uh, we'll do just a very, very quick recap of uh, our previous lecture, uh, simply because we got so much to cover today. This is, in my mind, this is going to be a really exciting lecture. But uh, we talked about uh, some of the Old Testament prophecies that uh, of the things that are going to happen in um, uh, Revelation 1 and uh, verse 1. So we've talked about the revelation of Jesus Christ as the book of Revelation uh, that's all primary about Jesus Christ. Uh, the intended audience of the book, which is to show his bond servants, and that being people of God, Jew or Gentile, who keep his commands and remain faithful to Jesus. And then the things and events, which much soon take place. Uh, we're centering on two main stories now, Israel, Jerusalem, the Jewish people, and the church. The church now is really coming in big time in the New Testament. So we've looked at fulfillment of God's covenants. Uh, we have looked at the day of the Lord, Jesus' second coming, God's wrath, his judgments, his rewards. Uh, previously, the marriage of the lamb and the restoration establishment of God's kingdom. And then last, uh, our last lecture, we specifically look at Yahweh, Yahweh the cloud rider, that uh, as the prophecy started to mature, we notice in Daniel 7, it's, the son of man, that's the cloud rider. But yet Yahweh is there uh, with him all the time. And we saw that little small vignette of uh, in the throne room of, of God. And then we, we, said, we looked a little deeper into Daniel. And Daniel, we started to realize that the Messiah was going to be put to death. And then we looked at the 77 prophecy uh, of Daniel and started to realize that uh, the Messiah's death was not only foretold, but it was foretold with some very, very precise dates. Very, very exciting stuff. And so then we looked at uh, prophecies that required um, uh, that, that required things to be put on hold until the full number of Gentiles come into the kingdom of God. Something that was very, very um, exciting. And then we started to look at the mystery and the purpose of the church and allowing uh, Gentiles full citizenship of Israel with all the con with all the uh, covenants as well. And then last but not least, we looked at the very exciting new covenant uh, that God gave to Israel and ultimately also to Israel and the church that will be fulfilled in the, in the last days of the Lord. So let's move on. We're now going past verse one. So, starting with verse 1, this is NIV, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants or his bondservants in ASB, what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to a servant, John. Now, new territory, verse 2, who testifies to everything he saw, and that is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. And blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, very unique to the book of Revelation. And blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it because the time is near. So let's unpack this. Revelations uh, 1 verse 2, who testifies to everything he saw. That is, that being the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. So we're already starting with a very, very powerful introduction um, that uh, John is referring to his vision as the word of God. And we know there's, there's kind of maybe a, a, a play on words here because yes, this is coming from God. So this is the word of God, but also who is the word of God? And we go back to John 1, 1, where he says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. And in 1 John 1, 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched this we proclaim concerning what? The word of life. Um, and then, of course, all this is culminated uh, in the end of Revelation, chapter 19, verse 13, where he, he being 
the Lord Jesus Christ is dressed in a robe, dipped in blood, and his name is the word of God. So it should come as no surprise that John refers to the visions that are given to him by Jesus Christ and by angels uh, as the word of God. But then he goes on to say, and the testimony of Jesus Christ. So what is he saying here is nothing more than he's saying this is the word of God and it's verified by Jesus himself. So this is such a strong introduction, but it should lead us to another very important inclusion, conclusion. And, and that is this. For some reason, churches seem to shy away from Revelation. Uh, Bible studies seem to shy away from Revelation uh, with, with, some, with some exceptions. And some of the exceptions are uh, Revelation and time charts and raptures and, and, and all this. But that's not what the purpose of Revelation is. And we need to be reminded that this often neglected book of Revelation is the very word of God addressed to his saints, us, about what to expect in our future and how to prepare in the, for the future. The book of Revelation is so incredibly important. And I'm just thankful we're studying it. So verse three, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy and blessed are those who hear it and take it and take to heart what is written in it because the time is near. Now I like the way the, uh, the complete Jerusalem Bible uh, translates this because they translate it as blessed are the reader and the hearers of the words in this prophecy provided they obey the things written in it for the time is near. So blessed is the one who reads aloud. Let me just say this. I do a lot of heavy studying in God's word. And then also I do a lot of devotionals with my wife. When I do devotionals, especially when I do devotionals with my wife, I read it out loud. And my wife follows along um, uh, word for word in the Bible. Guess what we have found out? We have caught more insights and truths because we read it aloud. Because we read it aloud, and uh, as we're reading it aloud, we're hearing and digesting what's being said, and it's like, huh, I didn't look at it that way. That's interesting. And my wife would go, yeah, that is very interesting. So, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And my encouragement to you is just try it. Try it. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. Okay, blessed are those who hear it. Now, what is he saying here? Well, I'll tell you what he's not saying first. What he's not saying is, oh, okay, I can uh, plug in Revelation on my phone, stick my earbuds on, and maybe listen to Revelation uh, while I'm driving or listen to Revelation uh, while I'm jogging or trying to go to sleep, and I'll be blessed. That's not necessarily what is being said here. And Jesus Christ enters into this conversation as well in chapters two and three, for seven times, seven times to each church, he says, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So one thing we need to keep in mind is God's word is living. It's powerful. Uh, it is hearing directly from God. It's hearing what the Spirit has to say. It's not something that we can just kind of, uh-huh, yeah, in the background, uh, listen to it, and okay, acknowledge, note it, and go on with our lives. No. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is important. Jesus Christ, earlier in his ministry in Matthew 13, he said, for, for this people's heart has become calloused. Now, we could say that 
for a lot of society in the world today. Unfortunately, we can say a lot of that for, for a lot of the church, churches in the world today. For this people's heart has become callous. They hardly hear with their ears. Um, they're probably multitasking on their phones. And they've closed their eyes to what's really being said. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand because that will lead to understanding with our hearts. And in turn, then, I would heal them. So blessed are those who hear it. That's how we need to interpret this verse. And then there's a condition, right? Provided they obey the things written in it or in NIV, and take to heart what is written in it. So the blessing only comes if we obey, if we take to heart what is being presented to us, what's being taught to us. Revelations 22, 7, every time things are uh, iterated and reiterated, we need to take note. Well, in the book of Revelation, it's reiterated. Revelations 22, 7, where Jesus says, look, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of this prophecy written in this scroll. So that should tell us something right there, just how important Revelation is and how we need to really dig into Revelation. Um, so often we're, we're, there's a verse in John 8, 32 that, that so often I hear preach across the pulpit. In fact, I, I, I attended a, a revival one time where a whole week's sermon was on this one verse. And the verse says, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Okay, good, we'll know the truth. Let's know the truth and the truth will set us free without reading the verse in front. And the verse in front, Jesus says, to the Jews who had believed him. So he's not just talking to the general audience. He's talking to specifically to Jews who had believed him. They believe he's the Messiah. And Jesus says, if you hold to my teaching, you are really then my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So don't take Revelations 1 verse 3 lightly. This is a very, very important verse that we need to take to heart. Um, but the verse goes on, because the time is near. Now, let me just ask this. How many of us believe we're living in the last days? You're definitely going to see my hand raised up. I am just, I am in utter amazement and shock what's going on in our world today. However, it's interesting because Paul wrote, gave a checklist, a checklist of 19 items. And these 19 items, he was basically saying, if, if, if these 19 items check off, guess what? We're living in the last days. And it's in 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, where he says, but mark this, or we can say in today's language, check it off. There will be terrible times in the last days, okay? What are these last days? People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful. How often do we see that? Unholy, without love, unforgiving, holding grudges, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, which is so evident in the church today, but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people. So my question to you, is there anything of these 19 items on the checklist that we're not seeing today? And not only not seeing today, but we're seeing it getting more and more evident in, in society. Um, social media, TV, 
uh, Hollywood, uh, our education system, our government. We are living in the last days. And I'll say that dogmatically. So the verse goes on, or chapter one goes on, verse four and five eight. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits before his throne and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. So let's break this down uh, to the seven churches. Now, there's a very important point in this one phrase and what we're going to see in chapters two and three that a lot of people, I think, uh, miss seeing. And that is people think Revelation is nothing more than a apocalyptic uh, letter. But when there are specific um, instructions um, or teachings given to a church, uh, a, a letter from an apostle to the church, uh, that makes Revelation also a, an epistle. So this is something that we really need to uh, keep in mind, and that is... This is also part of the epistles, the New Testament epistles. And, but the more obvious that we see is we listed all three members of the Godhead. This is coming. This is greetings coming specifically from the council of God. This makes Revelation so important. Okay, from him who is and was and is to come. That's, that's the name of the Father himself, right? You know, whether it be Yahweh or, or Jehovah, meaning he was, he is, he was, and always will be. But then we go, hmm, isn't Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever as well? Yes, that's true, but that's not the point in this verse. This verse is it's from the Father. It's from... I want to say this very clearly, the Holy Spirit, described as the seven spirits before his throne. Now you will see a lot of translations and commentators going, no, 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 not seven spirits, seven full spirit. Um, and we're going to look into that. And then obviously from the Messiah himself, God the Son, the Son of Man, from Jesus Christ, who's the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler from the kings of the earth. So beyond a shadow of a doubt, this is from, this is, this is from the complete Godhead speaking to his saints, and in this case, to the seven churches, giving seven churches uh, a very strong evaluation. But now let's go back to the seven spirits before his throne. Uh, remember when there's a little bit of, uh, mis, uh, of questions or misunderstanding or disagreement, what do we need to do? First and foremost, we need to take it to the original language, to the original Greek. And then from there, we can start to look at uh, how that compares to original language uh, throughout scripture. Well, guess what? The Greek text says beyond a shadow of a doubt, there are seven spirits. So let's lay that one to rest. Then let's say, okay, I'm not sure if I understand this. Well, let's see what the Bible has to say. Uh, first and foremost, uh, uh, spirits uh, in Hebrew, uh, uh, the Ruach uh, HaKadosh, which is kind of like the moving of air, the moving of wind that is holy, that permeates everything, that, that goes throughout the earth. Uh, we see it in Genesis chapter 1 as hovering over, um, over the earth. So there's... I guess for lack of a better words, there is a purpose behind the seven spirits. 
uh, the all-seeing, uh, all-knowing part of, of God. And then let's start to look at some of the verses in the, in the Old Testament, Proverbs 15, 3, where it talks about the eyes of the Lord are in every place, watching the evil and the good. Um, when we start getting into seven, uh, Zechariah. Zechariah is such an amazing uh, book in the Bible. I wish we could spend a full course just looking at all the chapters of Zechariah. But Zechariah 4, verses 2, starting in verse 2, where he says, he asked me, what do you see? And this is Zechariah in his vision. Uh, what do you see? I answered, I see a solid gold lampstand. Now, lampstand is singular here. That's very important. With a bowl at the top and seven lamps on it. So seven lamps, plural. With seven channels, once again, plural, to the lamps. Also, there are two olive trees by it. One on the right side of the bowl, one's on the left. And I asked the angel who uh, talked with me, what are these, my Lord? And he answered, do you not know what these are? No, my Lord, I replied. So he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Now, Zerubbabel was uh, the governor of, uh, of uh, Jerusalem, of Israel, that was in charge of rebuilding the temple um, after uh, the Babylonian uh, captivity. So this is the word of the Lord, of Yahweh, to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says Yahweh Almighty. Who dares despise the day of small things since the seven eyes of Yahweh that range throughout the earth will rejoice when they see the chosen capstone in the hand of Zerubbabel. The capstone being the capstone for the, for the temple in Jerusalem. Let's read in Revelation 3. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, these are the words of him, that being Jesus, who holds the seven spirits spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation for being alive, but guess what? You are dead. So now we're once again we're referring to seven direct spirits of God. Revelations 4, 5. This is in the throne room. From the throne. Now remember, this is in the throne room. This is very, very important came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. Okay, seven lamps. Well, yeah, we saw seven lamps in Zechariah. Uh, a lamp stand with seven lamps, right? And then it goes on, because then it explains what these seven lamps blazing are. These are the seven spirits of God. Wow, okay. The very next chapter, we're still in the throne room, but now we're, we're, we're seeing where the scroll is being handed to, to the Lamb of God. Revelations 5, 6. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Okay, I imagine there's a few uh, now that are saying, I'm confused. Help me out. Well, let's continue to look in, in uh, Scripture because Scripture does a wonderful job of explaining this. Um, a biblical comparison analogy would be what we just read um, in Revelation and in Zechariah, and that is look at the lampstand, the menorah. The lampstand was 
inside the tabernacle before the Holy of Holies, so before his throne. The menorah was built as instructed in amazing detail by God. I, I did a study on, on the tabernacle and, and every item in the tabernacle is just, it's eye-opening. But anyway, in great detail by God as, quote, a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. So the things that are up in heaven in the throne room. The menorah comprises seven individual lamps. One lamp stand, seven lamps on it, right? And we won't get go into all the scriptures, but they're listed there for your individual study. Um, or I can even give you notes from the, the tabernacle. Each one on its own separate branch, which portrays the seven spirits of God. Okay, so now we got a, a, a piece of furnishing that is a copy and a shadow of heavenly things in, in the heavenly court, and we see a single lampstand and seven lamps, right? So there are seven lamps on seven branches. But guess what? There's only one light. Similarly, this verse describes seven spirits, yet there's only one Holy Spirit. And if you expect um, for us to know and understand everything about God, well, guess what? We're human. Uh, but what we can do is accept what is written in the Holy Spirit, uh, Scriptures and just accept it. There's one God the Father, there's one God the Son, there's one God the Holy Spirit. Off, uh, we're seeing time and time again where we're getting a little confused of uh, is it Yahweh or is it Yeshua? Well, guess what? Also, uh, the Holy Spirit is described as a single lampstand, but seven branches, uh, seven lights, but one light, or seven lamps, but one light, and only one Holy Spirit. So let's move on because there's so much more to go. To him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom of priests to serve his God and Father. To him be the glory and power forever and ever. Amen. All right. So uh, one of the things that uh, hopefully we started to pick up and notice right away is that Jesus Christ by his blood has what? has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father. Well, we saw an earlier proposal, but it wasn't a proposal of, of uh, what I'm going to do for you, being the children of Israel, but if you do this for me, then I will make you um, a kingdom of priests and holy nations. So re to refresh our memories, where Yahweh says, now if you obey me fully, and keep my covenant, and then out of all nations, you will be my treasure possession out of all the world. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Well, we know that that did not come to pass because um, um, the children of Israel couldn't keep any type of a promise. But what was communicated to us is what God's intention was for mankind. We read from the Apostle Peter in 1 Peter 2, 5. You also, like living stones, that's talking to us, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ, or, Ye, or uh, Yeshua, the anointed one. And he goes on, verse nine, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. Well, we read about that in his Exodus, uh, God's treasured possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. 
an amazing promise. Let's read on. <clears throat> to him, Jesus, who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood and made us to be a kingdom of priests to serve his God and Father. Okay. Um, made us to be a kingdom of priests. Let's expand on that a little more. Revelation 5, where now we're back in the throne room, where they sang a new song saying, you, you, Jesus Christ, are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on earth. Remember, we, we honed in a couple of times already on the word reign as well, more to come. Compare this now uh, to what we just read in Exodus 19, which was conditional. Now, if you obey me, then I will make you a kingdom of priests and holy nation. We noticed that didn't work. So now let's compare that with Hebrews 9, verse 15. For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, which we discussed a little bit at our last lecture, that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant, which just further emphasizes how we have been purchased by his blood and we're being made to be a kingdom and priests to serve our Heavenly Father. Okay, now we get to verse 7, and now things are going to start getting more and more exciting. Behold, he is coming with the clouds. I'm not shouting. The scripture is shouting, all caps. And every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth, or it could be Israel, we'll get into that, will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. In one sense, this verse describes the whole theme of the book of Revelation, which is, he is coming. Yahweh the cloud rider is coming. The son of man, the cloud rider is coming. The day of the Lord, the second coming of Yeshua, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And this is all about part of the things which must soon take place in verse one. This summarizes it all. But let's start to unpack this. Uh, behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him. Well, who, who's he? I mean, especially for some of the, uh, the, the Jewish uh, rabbis that are, are just focused on the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament scripture. This is talking about Yahweh, right? Yahweh the cloud rider. Uh, those of us now that have looked a little further, especially in Daniel 7 and the New Testament, well, wait a minute, this is Jesus, right? Or is this both? Once again, we start to see this blending of the Father and the Son as, as being one. Even those who pierced him. Well, now we got a definitive clause. This is speaking of Yeshua, the Messiah, Jesus Christ and all the tribes of the earth. And in some translations will even say all the peoples of the earth. So the whole earth, the whole, uh, the whole population of the world will mourn over him. Well, is that really the proper translation? And how this translate actually does make a big difference. Because first and foremost, how does the whole world mourn over him whom they pierced. We're talking to a specific people group. So let's look at the Greek. The Greek word ge is, is uh, contracted from a primary word, and it can mean soil. It, by extension, it can mean a region. Uh, it could be a solid part, such as uh, terra firma itself, uh, or, or a whole country, or it could be ground, it could be land, it could be the whole world. But you got to look at the context to understand what the proper translation is. And the context here has one very, very important phrase. Even those who pierced him. 
Well, now we're talking about uh, Zechariah and Zechariah 12.10. This is, this is what sets the stage in the context for Revelation 1.7 and what it says. So I will submit right now, a more appropriate translation will be all the tribes of Israel will mourn over him. And so let's look at Zechariah 12.10. Zechariah 12.10, uh, verses and 11, where God says, I will pour out on the house of David. So that being the Jewish people and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So maybe even might be even more than that. It might be the Messiah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and of supplication so that they will look on me, Yahweh, whom they have pierced. No, wait a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. This is not Yahweh talking. This can't be. Whom they have pierced, that's the Messiah. That's Yeshua. So once again, we're seeing a little bit of this coming together. And they will mourn for him. That will be Yeshua. That will be the Messiah as one mourns for an only son, and they will weep bitterly over him, like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. This is personal. This is family. That's the reason why uh, all the tribes of Israel is the more important translation. And in that day, in that day is also a very important phrase in the Old Testament. In that day, speaks of the day of the Lord, speaks of the second coming. In that day, there will be great mourning in Jerusalem. Now, I took a quote out of the Jewish New Testament commentary because I thought this was a, a pretty good quote where he writes, the tribes of Israel will mourn Yeshua experiencing deep grief over centuries of having rejected him as a nation. And this grief will open the way to repentance and to accepting him, Yeshua, as Messiah and Savior of the Jewish people. This is what I believe uh, Revelations 1-7 is referring to because this is what Zechariah 12 is referring to. Compare that to Zechariah 13, verse 1. On that day, a fountain will be opened to the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and impurity. So taking in mind what we have learned from the previous lecture, what is that talking about? The new covenant the new covenant, where on that day, the Lord himself will cleanse his people from sin and impurity. But I don't want to digress too much because we got so much to go. Behold, he's coming with the clouds. Okay, and every eye will see him. All right, what's the Old Testament expectation? And does that differ from the New Testament expectation? Because this is very important, especially if we want to reach out to the Jewish people. So Old Testament expectations, we've already reviewed it uh, in Deuteronomy 33, the blessing of Moses. There is no one like the God of Jeshurun who rides across the heavens to help you, Israel, and on the clouds in his majesty. The eternal God is your refuge and underneath are the everlasting arms. He Yahweh will drive out your enemies before you, saying, destroy them. And so Israel will live in safety. Jacob will dwell secure in the land of grain and new wine, where the heavens drop to do. Blessed are you, Israel, who is like you, a people saved by Yahweh. He is your shield and helper and your glorious sword. Your enemies will cower before you, and you will tread on their heights. This is the expectation of behold, he's coming in the clouds and behold, he will be the Messiah. What they just don't realize is that it's him whom they pierced in the past. 
Psalm 68, verse four, sing to God, sing in praise to his name, extol him who writes the clouds. Rejoice before him. Well, who are we talking about? His name is Yahweh. But then we read earlier in Daniel 7, in my vision at night, I looked and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days. Well, that would be Yahweh. And he led and he was led into his presence. So now we're in the throne room. He was given authority, glory, sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every tribe worshiped him. They worshiped the son of man like they worship the ancient of days. Yes, his dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Now, while conveniently disregarding Daniel 7, verse 24, I think it is, where, where all of a sudden we read that the Messiah is going to be cut off. He's going to be killed from his people. And then we read in the 77s uh, a whole uh, dissertation about this with dates. But also in all that is that he will return. So Old Testament expectations. Let's look at some of the New Testament expectations. The New Testament expectations. Let's go to the authority. Jesus Christ, where Jesus said in Mark 13, 26, at that time, okay, that's just like in the Old Testament, at that time, that means the day of the Lord, that means the second coming, people will see the Son of Man. Well, that's Daniel. The Son of Man coming in clouds. That's Daniel with great power and authority. That's Daniel chapter 7. Uh, he says later in the Olivet Discourse, then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And we have yet to discuss the sign. And then all the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with glory and great power. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the heavens to the other. I have a funny feeling I did not do it, but I have a funny feeling that if we look at the old, at the New Testament Greek, it might be translated a little different than all the peoples of the earth. But moving on, 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 16 and 17, where Paul says, for the Lord himself, well, who's that? Yahweh? Maybe because we also have Yeshua who is proclaimed by Paul as Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, let's just read on. Uh, the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. And that's a very strong scriptural reference to the rapture, uh, which is also mentioned in uh, Matthew 24, uh, 30 up above, where uh, they will gather his elect, they being the angels from the four winds and from one end of the heavens to the other. But that's a totally different subject, totally different day to discuss. Revelations 19. The heavenly procession, the battle of Armageddon. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider was called Faithful and True. And with justice he judges and wages wars. His eyes are like blazing fire. On his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses, dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. 
That's right out of uh, Genesis 49. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty on his robe and on his thigh. He has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So this is the New Testament expectation of behold, he is coming with the clouds, which is all culminated into Revelations 19. But let's read on. Uh, so all the peoples on the earth, Israel will mourn because of him. This points very clearly now, I hope we can see that, to the Jewish people and to Israel who rejected Yeshua as the Messiah. In Zechariah 12, 10, looking at it again, I will pour on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me, the one whom they have pierced and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. It's explained, however, furthermore in New Testament, John 19, and as scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. Second Thessalonians, Chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, for you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of God's churches in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. You suffered from your own people the same things those churches suffered from the Jews who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and also drove us out. They displease God and are hostile to everyone. And we're going to read more about um, the suffering of the church and the martyrdom that's in uh, Revelation. But moving on, let's go to verse eight, because now things are now things are beginning to get exciting. We're Jesus. Now we're red letters. I am. I am the Alpha and Omega says, the Lord God who was and who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Okay, I'm confused again. Who's talking here? The Bible says red letters. Jesus, is this Jesus speaking? Is this Yahweh speaking or is it both speaking? Because I read, I am the Alpha and Omega. And we know God has everything under control, both the beginning, the Alpha and the end, Omega and eternity. And it's reiterated in Revelations 22, 13, where Jesus Christ says, oh, Jesus Christ says, I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. We also, we know the gospel itself can be seen like this because there's the coming of the Messiah and his atoning sacrifice. That was the Alpha, the first part. And then there's Jesus' second coming to conquer, to judge, to restore, to rule, and reign over heaven and earth. He's also the Omega, says the Lord God, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty, the Almighty. So once again, who's talking here? Is this Jesus talking? Is this Yahweh talking? Uh, is it both talking? You know, like Yahweh, as it says in Hebrews 13, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. So that's definitely he who is and was and is to come. But also let's keep in mind, Hebrews 1.3, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. And the fact that Jesus Christ is saying here that I am, I am the Almighty, that puts him what? On equal par with Yahweh. So what we're reading here is that Yahweh, Yeshua, they're on equal par. Now, one thing that uh, I picked up on that uh, I thought was very interesting, and that is, there's only two exceptions in the Bible, but with, with, that, with these two exceptions, neither Yahweh nor Yeshua ever said, we are. They always said, I 
am. Well, okay, but let's look at these exceptions. Well, the exceptions are found in John 17, 11 and John 17, 22. John 17, 11, Jesus Christ speaking, praying, I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, your name that you gave me, so that they may be one. And here's the first we are, as we are one. We are one. I am. We are one. He goes on in verse 22, I have given them glory, the glory that you gave me, and they may, that they may be one. Here's the other one, as we are one. Hopefully that puts a little clarity in just who is God the Father, who is God the Son, who is God the Holy Spirit, but there's more. So let's get to it. Verse nine, <clears throat> I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus and Yeshua was on the island of Patmos because the word of the God and the testimony of Jesus. So on the Lord's day, well, what's the Lord's day? The Lord's day is Sunday because that's the day uh, that Jesus Christ was resurrected from the dead. So that's been uh, referred to uh, in the New Testament and by the church as the Lord's Day. So on the Lord's Day, I was in the spirit and I heard behind me. Now let's clue in on that phrase, but we'll do it on the next slide. I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, write on a scroll what you see. Send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. So the next verse, I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among those lampstands was someone like a son of man dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow. And his eyes, his eyes were blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. And coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all of its brilliance. And we know we cannot look at the sun. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. <clears throat> so who is Jesus in all this? First and foremost, we talked a little bit on the verse in front, or I heard behind me, I turned around to see in verse 12, and when I turned, I saw. These are textual markers. So I just want to point that out because they're important because we're reading text. We're not seeing a video. Apostle John is seeing all sorts of things that's happening. We're not quite sure if they're all happening linear or if some of them, this is going on and while that's going on, this is going on. But what we do have are these textual markers. So when we see, and I heard behind me, or when I turn, I saw, that's a textual marker that, that means, okay, if this was a camera, we'd be shifting scenes, all right? So what he saw, heard behind him, what he turned and saw, that's all of chapter two and all of chapter three. That's the seven letters uh, to the churches. The next time we see a textual marker is in chapter four, verse one, where he says, after this, I looked and there before me. And that's another clue to the reader that we're now changing scenes, okay? Now, we still have to juggle with, our, is it linear or are we seeing something happen on top of something else happening? Or sometimes we might say, okay, 
we see this happening, and right at the tail end, just before that ends, we see this happening. So it's part of trying to interpret and understand Revelation, but that is the nitty gritty detail, to be honest. It's not the main theme of Revelations. But anyway, also in this verse, he says, I saw seven golden lampstands. Well, what is this? Revelation is full of all of these different uh, 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 symbols and symbolism and all that. So what are these seven golden lampstands? It must be mean something. Well, yeah. And what we find out is that time and time and time and time again in Revelation, a symbol will be brought forward, but then... A few verses later, or a chapter or two later, it will be fully explained to John what that symbol is. It's, called, it's almost like Jesus Christ saying, okay, time out. You saw the seven golden lampstands? Well, guess what? Verse 20, those seven lampstands, those are the seven churches. And like I said, this happens quite a bit in Revelation. So it's something to keep in mind uh, as we go through Revelation. But... Let's look at this powerful, powerful description of Jesus Christ. Um, and among the lampstands was someone like a son of man. We know now this is Jesus' preferred title for himself as Messiah. We know now why. This is part of the gospel, the message to the Jews they knew all about Daniel. They knew what the expectations were. And for Jesus Christ to refer to himself as the son of man, that takes Jesus and puts him straight in to Daniel. And then all of a sudden, it helps us to start to connect the dots. The reader begins to understand. Um, and so someone like the son of man dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his chest, what kind of garments are these? Jesus' heavenly garments here, they're priestly. And they point to a very important part of our Messiah and his role, especially now, before the, 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 uh, the establishment of the new heaven and the new earth. Now, sitting at the right hand of the throne of the Father, he is interceding on our behalf as a priest, a great high priest in heaven, but not from the old covenant and the old covenant and the order of Aaron, which a uh, priest had to come from the tribe of Levi because it was all part of Levitical priesthood, but in a new covenant in the order of Melchizedek. I wish we had time to... to uh, to look up Melchizedek in, in Genesis because it's an amazing, amazing story. But let's just take that as, as a, a fact. Uh, the order of Melchizedek, okay? Hebrews 4.14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest, Jesus Christ, who ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we prof uh, pro profess. Explain later in Hebrews 5. Once made perfect, he became, he, our Lord Jesus Christ, became the source of eternal salvation. Not temporary, eternal salvation for all who obey him and was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. And if perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, and indeed the law given to the people established that priesthood, why was there still a need for another priest to come? One on the order of Melchizedek, not on the order of Aaron. For when the priesthood is changed, the law must be changed also. He of whom these things are said belong to a different tribe. He's not, he's not from the tribe of Levi. He's from the tribe of what? Judah. And no one from that tribe has ever served the altar. For it is clear that our Lord descended from Judah. And in that regard to the tribe of Moses, to that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. And... What we have said is even more clear if another priest like Melchizedek appears, 
one who has become a priest, not on the basis of regulation or the law as to his ancestry, but on the basis of the power, the power of an indestructible life. For it is declared, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Now, the main point of what we're saying is this. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, by Yahweh, not by a mere human being. This is our Jesus Christ. All of a sudden now, Jesus Christ is taking on a new definition, a new focus of just who Jesus is, and we're just beginning. So, back to 13, 14, 15, 16. I put them out in bullets. Someone like a son of man. Right out of Daniel. The hair on his head was white, like wool, as white as snow. Yes. His eyes were like blazing fire. Okay, verse 14. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace. His voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. Coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. His face, his face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. Who is this? Who is this Jesus Christ? And that's what now chapter one goes more into and what we're going to go more into. So who is this Jesus Christ? We read in 16, coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. Well, we start to look at previous passages in scripture and and pieces start to come together. Hebrews 4, verse 12, for the word of God... We know who the word of God is. It's the word and the person is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing, nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Okay, a little more about Jesus Christ. His face was like the sun shining in all of his brilliance. There's a passage called the Transfiguration of Jesus Christ where mm, it's kind of a watered down description, I think, of what really happened, but maybe it was all that uh, the New Testament writer thought people could comprehend where it says, Matthew 17, after six days, Jesus took him, Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led him up to a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun. That is not just a glow or a Moses glow coming out of down from Mount Sinai. His face shone like the sun in all of its brilliance. And his clothes became white as the light. Now also we must keep in mind, this is Jesus Christ before his crucifixion, before his resurrection, before coming back up into the throne room of God. But even then, what we're seeing here is amazing. Verse 17, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. I know I would. I'd be falling prostrate. I, but this is more than my brain can comprehend, can process. You know, and for John, John thought he knew Jesus Christ. He, he, he was his disciple. Uh, he, he listened to his teaching. He followed him everywhere he goes. So he, you know, he, he saw him, he, he touched him, uh, he broke bread with him. But uh, this is not the Jesus that, that he spent time with. 
He knew Jesus from his first coming as a sacrificial lamb, not his return as the lion from the tribe of Judah, that which was already foretold all the way back in Genesis, where uh, Judah was uh, prophesied over and said, you are a lion's club, Judah. You return from the prey, my son. Like a lion, he crouches and lies down like a lioness. Who dares to rouse him? Who are we talking about here? The lion from the tribe of Judah. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until, here's the gospel message, until he to whom it belongs shall come and the obedience of the nations of all the earth shall be his. So we got to keep on asking this question. Who is Jesus Christ? Uh, John is now seeing a more complete Jesus in his glory. Not just the lamb, but the lion of the tribe of Judah. Um, in his glory, and in his majesty, and in his power. And we have yet to see, like Revelations 19, we have yet to see Revelations 5. But let's go back to what Jesus said during his ministry for more clues. Where he says in the Olivet Discourse, when the Son of Man comes, that be me, Jesus, comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. Luke 9, 26, whoever's ashamed of me and my words, the son of man, once again, we keep seeing the son of man uh, being plugged in there. Go to Daniel if you want to understand. We'll be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the father and of the holy angels. I mean, I begin to think that what John is seeing here in uh, Revelations chapter one is just scratching the surface of, of what is yet to come. I think what is yet to come is just going to explode our minds. So who is this Jesus? I, I've done a lot of uh, searching on the internet, trying to find uh, a picture of Jesus Christ as described in Revelations chapter one. And guess what I find? This is what I find all the time. This is the Jesus Christ that the artists of the world portray Jesus as, this kind, this gentle man uh, uh, who, who carries lambs. Uh, he has a sickle. Uh, he'll have children in his lap. Um, is this the Jesus I, I worship? Well, this is a small part of Jesus, but I, I, I fear that a lot of people have turned away from Jesus Christ because they don't see Jesus in his glory, in his majesty, in his power to come and rule and reign. They see this guy that just kind of basically lay down on the altar and had himself sacrificed. Okay, there's a lot more to Jesus than that. So I have to ask the question, who is Jesus Christ? And in my searching of uh, trying to find some picture, I mean, even the pictures where it talks, where it shows Jesus uh, being high and lifted and exalted, it's still, it's nothing like what is being described in Revelation. So here's the closest I found. The closest I found, uh, this is from an artist, uh, his ministry is called Drawn to Him. And so he draws, uh, he's drawn to the Almighty God. And he, he has wonderful uh art illustrations with uh, devotionals. But anyway, this is one of his pictures of Jesus Christ as he appeared to Saul on the road of Damascus, where suddenly in Acts 9, a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And of course, Saul is going, who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. This is the Jesus Christ in his glory, in his majesty. This is the resurrected Jesus Christ um, that we need to 
get a firmer understanding and a grasp of who he is and who we are serving. So we're going to take time out. We're going to look at some theology on Jesus Christ. Um, uh, and what we're going to find out is that it's all there. It's, all, it's been in the Bible all along. But for some reason, uh, quite often, the church does not portray Jesus uh, this way, which is kind of sad. Um, Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God, God is Elohim. Uh, and God could be El, uh, uh, singular, Elim, uh, which, or no, Elah, which is, uh, Elah, which is God uh, as two. So you could say father and son, Elah, or God, plural, without a number, Elohim. Um, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay, was Jesus Christ part of that? You betcha. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. And then listen, through him, through him being Yeshua, Jesus Christ, all things were made. Through Jesus Christ, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. So he's, the, he's our God of all creation. Colossians 1, 15 and 17. The Son is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn over all creation. Now, firstborn here is more like a, a title. Firstborn would be like he who gets all the inheritance from, the, from, uh, from his father, uh, from, from the other children. Uh, it's head of the spiritual family here is, is more the context. Over all creation. For in him, in Jesus, all things were created. Okay, all things were created. What are we talking about here? <clears throat> things in heaven and on earth. Things visible, invisible. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is, he being Jesus Christ is before all things and in him all things hold together. This is a little more than the Jesus Christ that is so often portrayed by artists or that we find as pictures in our Bible. He is also our atoning sacrifice, the lamb. Isaiah 53, surely he took up our pain, he bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted, but he was pierced. He was killed for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities, the punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all, like sheep, each and every one of us have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way and Yahweh has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That is also our Jesus Christ. Salvation in Acts 4 is found in no one else for there's no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. So he's our ticket into the new heaven and new earth, as we talked about earlier. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. In other words, there's nothing more important than this. That Christ, that Messiah, that the anointed one died for our sins, According to the scriptures, which we've read like in Isaiah 53, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. It's all there. It's all there in the Old Testament. So he's the redeemer of mankind, of all mankind. Revelations 5, now we're back up in the throne room. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders, that being the 24 elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which now we know are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. He went and took the scroll from the right hand from him who sat on the throne, the Ancient of Days, our Heavenly Father, and when he had taken it, the four living creatures 
and the 24 elders, now stop and think about this, the four living creatures and the 24 elders, day and night, without stop, encircled the throne of Yahweh, the Ancient of Days, uh, God the Father, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who is and was and is to come. Their total attention has been on God the Father. Now listen to this. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, before Yeshua, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. The, 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 and each one had a harp and they were holding gold bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song saying, you, Yeshua, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchase for God persons from every tribe, every language, every people, every nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on earth. This is our Jesus Christ. He's the redeemer of all mankind. Let's move on. He is also our conquering ruler, the lion from the tribe of Judah. We already talked about Genesis 49.10, where the scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he to whom it belongs shall come, and the obedience of the nations shall be his. Psalms 2, I will proclaim Yahweh's decree. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. That's our Jesus Christ. Philippians 2, 6. Who being the very nature of, God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And therefore, God, Yahweh, exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that's above every name, that at the name of Jesus, Yeshua, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is powerful. This is who is our Jesus Christ. Now, hopefully it starts to make sense when we go back to Revelation 19, where I saw the heaven standing open. And there before me was a white horse whose rider is faithful and true. And with justice, he judges and wages wars. His eyes are like blazing fire and on his head many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood. And his name is the word of God. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword in which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has the name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's our Jesus Christ. He is also among many things, as we see here, he's wearing many crowns. He is our conquering ruler, the lion, the lion from the tribe of Judah. Now listen to this, Hebrews 1.3. The son, Yeshua, is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, his being, Yahweh, sustaining all things, sustaining all things by his powerful word. That makes him the Lord God Almighty. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven, which is where he is today. First Corinthians 8, 6, uh, word for word in the Bible, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things, from whom are all things, and we exist for him. And one Lord, Jesus Christ, 
by whom are all things and we exist through him. So if there's any ideas of that uh, Yahweh is Jesus and, Jesus and, and, uh, and, and it's all one because no longer we have Yahweh, but we have Jesus, no. There is one God, the Father. I rewrote 1 Corinthians 6. Actually, I, I just took out a couple of words and then put it in parallel to help us understand a little more what we're talking about here. There is one God. Make most, no mistake about it. There's one God. The Father, Yahweh, from whom are all things. So from Yahweh, the Father, are all things. And we exist for him. Got it? Okay. There is one Lord, Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, Yeshua the Anointed One. Okay. By, not from, by whom are all things. So all things exist by him. All things exist from the Father. And we exist through him, through Jesus Christ. This is such a powerful statement of to who Jesus is, of who Yahweh is. Um, this is our Jesus Christ. So hopefully now, when we see the Jesus that's played out in chapter one, it all starts to make sense. And when we see Jesus Christ in chapter four and chapter five, it will all start to make greater sense. And when we see Jesus Christ coming with his armies in Revelations 19, it will all start to make much more sense. But there's more. So we gotta finish up this chapter real quick because this is powerful as well. Oh, this is so powerful. Revelations 1.17. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. Now this is the Lamb of God. This is the Jesus that, so, that is so often portrayed. So I don't wanna discount that. But Jesus says, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. So once again, the I am's. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead and now look, I am alive forever and ever. And then he says this, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Whoa, what a powerful, 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 powerful statement. It just doesn't get any more powerful than this. This speaks of Jesus' absolute control and power over the destiny of angels, of principalities, of rulers, authorities, over all of mankind. This power and authority is absolute and is reserved only to the Almighty God. That's our Jesus Christ. That's our Yeshua HaMashiach. That is Jesus in his, all of his, in his glory and honor and majesty and power and dominion. This is who our Jesus is. And I'm so proud to serve him. So honored to serve him. Anyway, last two verses. Right, therefore, what you have seen, what is now, and what it will take place later, the mystery of the seven stars that you saw on my right hand, oh, by the way, uh, and, and of, of the seven golden lampstands, oh, by the way, it's this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. And we will get into that in our next lecture, where we will start with chapter two. So I hope by now we have a greater understanding and appreciation of Revelation chapter one, verse one, which tells us Revelation, Jesus Christ. This is the revelation 
of Jesus Christ. Revelation is all about Yeshua. It's all about Jesus and what he is going to do in establishing a new heaven and a new earth and to rule and reign and to judge. So with that, we'll end there and we'll pick up uh, next week with chapter two.